Hello, I'm Kirk Montgomery. Welcome to a very special tour of a haunted West Michigan. We will introduce you to some of the scariest places around our area and tell their stories. Communities dating back hundreds of years tell tales of tragedy, murder, and the occult. We will travel throughout the area and share some of these stories of a haunted West Michigan. Under the pale light of a full moon, with a cold dirt path beneath your feet, you come across a centuries-old cemetery. Fog rolls past the forgotten tombs, the crisp fall air pierced by a howl as dry as decaying leaves crunch under your stride. From hospitals to hotels, lighthouses to landmarks, domiciles to dungeons, West Michigan is steeped in history, some of it otherworldly. Our first stop on our tour of haunted West Michigan is an Allegan County jailhouse built at the turn of the century. The historic building was home to the county sheriff and his prisoners and is now a museum that's open to the public. But some say that it's more than just the museum guests that roam its many hallways. As soon as you step inside the door of this Victorian style building, you take a trip back in time. Every room in the building is full of artifacts dating back to the early 1800s, including the weathered and rusty iron bars of the cells that held West Michigan's worst. This building was actually built in 1906. The jail could house 36 inmates at a time over multiple floors. Five inmates that passed away on the premises. A former sheriff also passed away on the grounds, and some visitors to the jail museum have had unexplained experiences. <laughs> but the encounters that they had were not with the former inmates. I like to say that we've got about seven permanent residents here in the building. A seventh resident, a nine-year-old girl from the Victorian era that drowned in an Allegan Lake in 1892. We know her name and we have a lock of her hair and a little flower. The family found this little Bible and donated it to the Allegan County Historical Society. But unbeknownst to them, there was an envelope inside the Bible. And inside the envelope was a lock of hair and a flower. And on the outside of the envelope, it says a lock of hair and a flower from our little darling's grave. Are you giving me my hug? Paranormal investigators have been drawn to this location for years and have made contact with the little girl. I feel you. She's also supposedly very mischievous. She will run by and, and pull on clothing. They've also found her up in the very top floor, hiding in the attic. Or something here about something about... Rick Wade is a seer. A little brave, a little maybe. Who says he has the ability to connect with spirits, and he attempted to make contact two years ago. He used a method called electronic voice <laughs> phenomenon or EVP. You can actually hear a spirit on an audio. You actually play an audio, you'll say a few words, and then all of a sudden you'll play it back and you'll hear voices on there. Are there anybody down here? Rick conducted several of these EVP sessions throughout an evening at the old jail museum. Have you been here for a while? I can hear the, the little girl saying, right here. Be quiet a second, listen here. Right here. And that wasn't the only voice that was caught on a recording that night. Hear it? I'll slow it down for you. Whether or not the curators of the museum believe it is haunted. You can't help but have some belief in, in that. To what extent it is, I don't know. They respect the spirits that may inhabit the building. I always make it a point to tell them goodbye every time I leave. You can try to contact the spirits of the old jail museum for yourself. The museum is home to the Allegan County Historical Society, and it's open on Saturdays all October long with free tours available. Just be sure you tell the ghosts goodbye when you leave. Our next stop on our tour of haunted West Michigan is a ghost town in more than one sense of the word. This small village nestled just about a mile north of the Indiana border is home to a dwindling population of mortals. But the ghost hunters of Galeen say that the paranormal population is on the rise. A main street that used to bustle with activity now looks like a ghost town. The town just pretty much folded up. 
The abandoned storefronts that once were home to local small businesses, now desolate. If you drive through town, you'll see the buildings are just used for storage. The school closed, then shortly after that, the bank closed, then we lost our grocery store and it's been downhill since then. And while the population of people declined, many think the paranormal population is on the rise, including ghost hunter Kim Rowe. The ghosts outnumber the people here by a long shot. But Kim started out as a skeptic. I want to prove they don't exist. So she put together a team. And then that way we can get more stuff done. And after just a few investigations, her skepticism disappeared. I don't think there's a house or a business or an empty building in Galena that does not have at least a ghost in it. You just might not know it, you don't hear them, you don't see them, they're there. The team can vouch for that. Her team began to do more and more investigations and soon found one of the most haunted buildings in Galena. I don't think there's any place that's been more active than the high school. We've seen the shadow people, we've seen orbs, we've heard the voices, we've all been touched or scratched or whatever the case may be. The school closed in 2011 and the previously boisterous sounds of students in the hallway and classrooms faded. Or did they? That recording was taken in the high school and sounds like a child saying, I want to play. Kim and her team spent months in the school recording their otherworldly experiences. It took several months to be able to hear the voices on the recorders. You have to train your ears to be able to pick those out unless they're very loud. The recordings are what's known as electronic voice phenomena or EVPs and Kim was finding them all over the place. On a Saturday night it was nothing to go back over our recorders and catch over 350 different EVPs in one night in one night. And those EVPs were caught at other locations in the town as well. The little jail is another active place. A two-cell jail in the town once held criminals more than a century ago. Rusted steel bars and carvings in the wooden cell walls speak of another time. We got a male voice loud and clear. It's on our Facebook page. A man saying, Frank, Let's kill him, Frank. And as Kim and her team of paranormal investigators found more and more evidence, people in the town began to take notice, and the team started to make house calls. Ernie Holmes, Ernest, I guess they called him. Some people call him Ernie, passed away in the house. One of those homes, originally owned by a descendant of one of the first settlers in the area, is now owned by Angela Green's mother. We have the will and the deed and it states in the will that he wanted his family to have the house forever. Ernest's heirs didn't honor his wish and sold the home shortly after he died. It's not uncommon to witness strange things happen in the home. The refrigerator walked itself out to where the cord almost came out of the wall. Nightstands shake. Lids flip off bins. My sister has seen Ernie appear in front of her. While staying the night in the home during an unbearably hot summer, Angela's sister had a close encounter with what she believes was the spirit of Ernest Holmes. Somebody grabbed me in the chest area, grabbed me, and I felt the squeeze, and I'm like, that's, I'm the only one up here in this room. This is not right. And what she saw next would be forever burned into her memory. And there was a figure standing at the foot of my bed upstairs, and he had a long beard, he was kind of, he wasn't trimmed up. It was all scraggly kind of looking and an old, like a black hat, top hat. After that encounter, Angela would come across a relative of Ernest Holmes and a photo surfaced. And what it revealed was an eerie, otherworldly experience. Somebody's got to tell me what's going on in this house because it was the picture. It was the guy that woke me up. Another person also died in the home. I'd rather think I was crazy than actually know somebody was in here. You know what I mean? But then when she told me somebody was in here, well, my brother's urn just fell off around my neck. That's great. Chandra and Angela's brother, Michael, passed away in a bedroom upstairs. And while Angela was talking about her brother, a keepsake she wore around her neck. That's my brother's urn. Slipped off. I have my brother's ashes in here. Yeah, somebody just took my necklace off, almost like I felt somebody back there. He was always my mom's protector. And if he's here, I feel like he's here protecting her still or protecting her from what's here because once you pass you know what's here and with that kim went to work to find out what was there we'll start down here ernest are you here the attempts made to connect 
there anybody down here that wants to communicate? Seemed unsuccessful at first, but the tapes told a different tale. You hear the Michael? Do you hear somebody say Michael? Hang on. Also recorded was a whisper. The name Ernest. Go up there. The team moved their investigation upstairs to the room where Michael died. Are there any spirits here with us? Mike, are you in here with us? Mike, are you in here with us? It's garbled, but what he's saying is help me. But what bothered me is if it is Mike and he's saying help me, why? Kim's recordings might show the existence of spirits in the home, but the question remains, who is it and what do they want? You definitely, definitely got paranormal activity in your house. There is no doubt about it. People in Galeen get to know their ghosts. Come look at it. But contact with them never ceases to be thrilling. I still can't explain some of the things that we capture. Something just pulled my hair. <laughs> and scary. Oh yeah, there's times where I want to run. But even though things can get scary, Kim and her team of Galeen Ghostbusters are always ready for a ghost hunt. If we have to be known for ghosts, so be it. But to really find out for yourself, you'll need to walk the empty streets and look into the abandoned storefronts of Galeen. You talk to anybody here, they've got activity. And that's why this pack of paranormals keep continuing their work. Galeen is a ghost town in more than one way. Kim and her team of Galeen ghost hunters are part of Michiana Paranormal Investigations. If you need some help with some unwanted house guests from the paranormal realm, you can always call the Galeen Ghostbusters. Well, standing tall along 3,200 miles of Michigan coastline are beacons in the dark, heralding sailors to safe ports. Lighthouses, once manned by dedicated keepers, are now quiet. Their former keepers long since passed. But one Michigan woman is certain that spirits of these men continue to inhabit the structures, making sure that the beacons stay lit. The Great Lakes are known to be cruel especially as the warm summer months slip away and fall encroaches on the coast. Our big lake to the west, Lake Michigan, is known to have some of the deadliest waters in America and the world, but troubled sailors can always look to the shore for a beacon. We have more lighthouses in Michigan than any other states. We've got 120 around the, the shorelines of Michigan, the earliest dating back to the 1820s. These historic lighthouses dot the shoreline, many over 100 years old, formerly manned by keepers who were dedicated to their craft. When I get that list done, um, Diana Stampler writes about these storied structures and believes that there is something otherworldly about Michigan's lighthouses. Many of our keepers served 20, 30, 40 plus years some of them it was their only job. Some died during lighthouse service. And I think those factors play into why their spirits are still there. Hauntings are rumored to be happening at lighthouses around the state, from Marquette to Whitehall, Saginaw to South Haven. They're simply keepers who I think are so passionate about what they did as a lighthouse keeper and are so dedicated even in the afterlife to their lights that they just hang around. One of those keepers lived in a home built on a bluff overlooking the Black River. South Haven is a unique setup in that the keeper's residence was not attached to the light tower itself. Diana visited South Haven's historic lighthouse in search of a former keeper. I was there looking for one specific person and that was Captain James S. Donahue. Captain Donahue served as the keeper from 1874 to 1909 and his commitment to the job was unmatched. Crawling on his hands and knees, either on the pier or the catwalk, with a lantern clenched between his teeth just to get out to the light to, to make sure that it was lit. Captain Donahue was a Civil War soldier who lost a leg in battle. He's buried in a nearby cemetery, but is he truly at rest? Mainly people on the main level hearing footsteps upstairs when no one was there, even a distinct walk because he would have had a peg leg. The accounts of Captain Donahue's distinct walk being heard isn't the only odd occurrence to happen in the old lighthouse. We've also heard accounts of some of the doors popping open when no one was there. <laughs> She has also investigated the White River Light Station in Whitehall, which is also believed 
to be haunted. We had a gentleman by the name of Bill Robinson who came to the area with his wife Sarah. Robinson was put in charge of building a lighthouse to help ships hauling lumber find their way into the White River. After its completion, he was installed as keeper from 1876 to 1919. Robinson would eventually die there the day before he was to vacate. He built that place and that's his lighthouse and he's there. He has been heard walking around at night, checking the lens tower area and making sure that everything is okay. And another spirit may be lingering here within the walls of the beacon that Robinson built his wife. Bill's wife, Sarah, which is really the most interesting story I think that comes out of this light. Sarah was known in town as a meticulous housekeeper. And some think that Sarah continues to be as meticulous about her housework in death as she was in life. The most recent residents had an encounter when they were about to dust a display case. And her phone rang and she had to go downstairs and answer phone. So she set her dusting supplies down, she went downstairs and when she came back, Somebody had already dusted and the dusting supplies had moved from one side to the other, yet no one was here but her. Whether or not that claim is true, the common theme with the occult is that history and hauntings kind of go hand in hand. But is there really any truth to it? Every lighthouse seems to have its ghost story and whether it's true or not, it's it's a romantic part of lighthouse lore that every light has its ghost feeling the past. Paranormal investigator Amber Rose Hammond. Energies forever. And medium Exe Susan Smith were drawn to that very light. Hello. To find out if the tales told about the White River Light Station had any merit. I like to come in a blank slate because then anything I see, feel, or hear is verification. The two set up their equipment and then began their search. Well, let's do a sweep of the place. To find any spirits who still reside within the White House walls. Somebody that likes this window. I think it's the woman. There's a boy and a girl. I get them here. Exie claims she was able to sense the former keeper, Bill Robinson. If Captain William Robinson is still in this light, we'd love to say hello. He is here. And his wife, Sarah. This is who's here. She is here. She paces. The digital recorders the team set out seemingly captured a result. But another method may provide a better channel to the lighthouse's paranormal residents. We could probably try the Estes method. The Estes method uses noise blocking headphones with sweeping radio signals piped into them. A receiver wears the headphones as an operator asks questions. I'll let you adjust them. Do you want me to Hang say on. what I hear? Yep. Despite the receiver not hearing the questions, they responded with what they hear through the radio noise. Are you still here at this light with us? Hi. Stuck. If someone's stuck, who's stuck? Kids. Kids are stuck? Wife. Is Bill Robinson still maintaining watch over the entrance to White River? He's never left and that he never will. Is Sarah still making sure that the house is well kept for her visitors? That's the place that she finds comfort. Maybe these lighthouses aren't just a guide. The welcoming light could also be the glow of a dedicated keeper from a bygone era who didn't let death end his duty. They love their job so much that even a hundred years after they're gone, their spirit still lingers. Perhaps the former keepers are still keeping a vigilant eye on the waters of Lake Michigan, guiding sailors to safety from the beacon high atop their towers. Now we're gonna take a trip down a short unsuspecting road just south of Lansing before it ends abruptly at a red gate. Beyond it lies a curse that dates back hundreds of years. Seven Gables Road is said to be one of the most haunted places in Michigan and present day thrill seekers still flock to find the source of the hauntings. It's a legend that has been passed down for years and affirmed by many visitors who share their otherworldly experiences. Probably a better idea to squeeze through this way. It's a long hike deep into the woods through a canopy of trees that insulates any noise from the outside. The path is quiet and tranquil, 
in the light of day. I've been coming out here for 30 years. As you walk, you might notice a sparsely walked path through the trees. It leads to the location where a house once stood. Now, since the house was torn down 80 odd years ago, you know, the, the way it's everybody that knew about it is gone. Traveling down the path, you'll end up where that house once stood. You can see like the stones from the foundation. Remnants of a past life. That's an old hasp off a barn door. Many believe that what's left of the home is connected to something. The death of children, the idea of witchcraft. Sinister. People get angry when you talk about it. The terrifying tale has transcended generations and turned into legend in the small community of Dansville. So grows the legend. Of Seven Gables Road. That's the most haunted road in Michigan. To find your way, you'll need to first pass through the rusty, wrought iron, and padlocked gate, and it will lead you to this dirt road where there's just 5,000 acres of nothing. But beyond that gate, in that vast space of nothing, paranormal investigators are seeing something. There's really just this one way in. I think it's creepy. The legend states that the gate is a threshold separating safety. If you cross the gate, bad things will happen. From an evil presence that lies beyond. Once there was a witch that lived in a cottage back in the woods. The witch was accused of killing several children while their parents were away. The community responded with vigilante justice and trapped her inside the house and set it on fire. Before she burned to death, she cursed the land to make it uninhabitable. If you were on the other side of the gate, so you're exploring her land and you hear a woman scream, the last person back over the gate will be dead within three days. Years would pass after the witch's death, but the curse did not. This family built a house, they moved in, the father started to kind of go a little crazy, and then one night he killed his whole family hung them all from the gables of the house. The father is said to have hung himself from what's known as the hanging tree. And today, having otherworldly experiences out here isn't out of the ordinary. I was camping, it was dead quiet. We heard what I would call a scream. Uh, and it sounded like a woman's scream to me. Never saw anything. Welcome to Seven Gables Road. Some experiences caught on tape. What was that? A very visible, mist type figure. What was that? And I saw it that night, not just on the camera, but I saw it with my eyes as it ran by. Late one night. Super dark. I'm the type of person that seeks out answers. Paranormal investigators Gary Gerke. I see spirits. And Cat Ryan were lured by the lore. See if anything happens to make its presence known. They headed out past the gate and down the trail. Each step they took disrupts the eerie silence. The deeper we go in, the more I get an icky feeling. It didn't take long before they spotted something. There's two shadow people. They're like standing in the middle of the path. Mm -hmm facing yeah, us. We get to go back that way. Further down the path, right here's your tree. They reached the hanging tree. You can see where there's a big broken limb. Until that limb broke off that tree, we would never get a pitcher to turn out. And then every time we have been back since, we've taken pictures of that tree and they have turned out. Gary and Kat have captured proof of other anomalies though caught some orbs on camera. Like it's made of light, but then it disappears. Strange sounds also call from the darkness as they travel further down the path. Well, I can guarantee you this much. If we hear it again, I won't be the last person over that gate. Is the legend of Seven Gables Road simply a tall tale? I have not found anything to prove that anything of that nature happened out here. Or can some truth be found? I know what I heard. No matter what you believe, there is one certainty. Everybody's got a story about Seven Gables. Especially if they decide to test fate. The last one over, first to die. Beyond the gate. This road is absolutely haunted. Absolutely. The trails at Seven Gables Road are open to the public. You can explore the legend for yourself, but remember to not be the last one past the gate when you leave. Well, the West Michigan Cemetery, tucked away in the hills of Grand Haven, is claimed by many to be one of the most haunted in the entire country. Decades of unexplained experiences have given birth
to this legend. Lake Forest Cemetery is home to many of the founding fathers of Grand Haven, but also found there thousands of unidentified people buried on top of each other in a mass grave. There are believers and there are skeptics, and both can be found on guided tours through the graveyard. There are so many hidden stories in the cemetery. These stories date back over 100 years. It's old, it goes back to 1873. And with its old age comes legends of the occult. I believe there's something we can't explain. Based on experiences by visitors, many have concluded not all of the souls resting here are truly at rest. Maybe something in our energetic being does leave something behind that people are picking up on or seeing somehow. Guided tours take curious visitors through the century-old graveyard. We are asking everyone to sign our waiver. To learn more about the myth of Lake Forest Cemetery. We came up with some great stories that we want to share with you tonight. One of the first stops is to the grave of a man who holds a unique record. Now this is one of the first murders in Ottawa County that's on record. The gravestone sits in Potter's Field where Grand Haven's poor and unidentified are buried. Anywhere from 1,200 to 1,500 bodies buried side by side on top of each other in this space. Some have claimed to have had unexplained experiences while walking by. So when I came through and took someone who claimed to be psychic and felt things through this area, they knew nothing about the history of this spot. And so as we walked through, he stopped and said, wait a minute, what is, what is going on here? This is weird. And the only way he could describe what he was seeing was how he said oil slicks just moving through the air above him. The tour heads to the next location to learn about the legend. It doesn't look so scary anymore. Of the blue man. There's a cool old tombstone up there. Up there will take you up a hill on what is known as the stairway to hell. Up here, if you've ever been in the cemetery, is Fairy Hill. The hill gets its name from William Ferry, one of Grand Haven's founding fathers. He is buried there under a solid slab of granite, along with all of his relatives. The blue man is a glowing blue figure that has been seen up on that hill looking down. The common thought is that the blue man up on the hill is no other than William Ferry himself. One of the stories always said too that he was upset about his tomb being vandalized, so now he watches and he waits for anyone to come back up and disturb him and his relatives. As the tour continues on to its next destination, the sun has set and a shroud of darkness is now over the crypts. Right here is an unmarked grave of Peter Koopman. It was late November 1922. Koopman owned a saloon in downtown Grand Haven, which wouldn't have been a very profitable business during Prohibition, except that Koopman made his own moonshine. The only problem is that Koopman was a big drinker of his own liquor. And one night, Peter Koopman shot his wife, Kate, in the back. The murder was here. This house is a consignment store right by the library called Second Impression, where this happened. When you walk into this consignment store, there's a big, beautiful wooden staircase going to the upstairs, and she was found crumpled there right at the bottom. Now the owners of the business and their employees claim that strange things occur there. And they'd hear sounds, footsteps, especially the upstairs where the formal wear is sold. The formal wear would be cleaned up the next day. One of the workers, the girls that was working there, uh, she was a high schooler, and right during the day, not at night when most people expect it, she saw a full-bodied white apparition come down the stairs and disappear. Investigators have uncovered some of what they think is proof of the paranormal. We got an interesting recording. You hear a very creepy voice say, I'm not happy, I'm not happy, I'm not happy, and then there's a pause. And then you hear very breathy, help me. Because of what he did, Peter Koopman's family never gave him a gravestone. Are there restless spirits trapped in between realms in Potter's Field? Is the blue man actually William Ferry guarding the graves of his family high atop Ferry Hill? And does the ghost of Koopman's wife haunt the home where she was murdered? Maybe these stories will spark some interest in our community's history. And maybe these stories, you can't deny that something is going on, are just the beginning of a larger story of redemption, revenge, and finding a final place to rest. 
a lot of people want that validation that there's something else beyond you know, our mortal existence. Very rarely do you get something, but again, it's when you do get something unexplainable that keeps you searching. And to this day, people still search for answers surrounding the legends of Lake Forest Cemetery. You can try to ascend to the stairway to hell and see if you can spot the blue man for yourself during seasonal Lake Forest Cemetery tours all throughout the month. Michigan's long history is full of tales of terror and tragedy that can be explored through its many haunted locations. The tour we took today is only a very small look at the spooky spots that dot West Michigan. You can learn more about the haunted locations we have visited today and learn of a few more on our website, 13onyourside.com, if you dare.